Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all, depending on where you are joining us from um, across the world. I'm Rachel Sanderson. I'm the Vice Principal for External Relations at the University of Glasgow. And it is my immense pleasure to welcome you to our third Facebook Live event. Um, it is the third event that we have run, but it is the first event that we ever have ever attempted remotely. Um, so please bear with us. Um, I know that you can see our glorious campus uh, behind us and some of our Zoom backdrops. Um, I can let you know though that sadly you're not on the campus. We are all participating from the safety of our own homes in living rooms and kitchen dining tables. Um, what I would like to do is uh, introduce you first and foremost to the panel that we are joined by today. Um, first of all, our Principal and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Sir Anton Moscatelli, our Student Representative Council President, Scott Kirby, our Clerk of Senate and Vice-Principal, Professor Jill Morrison, and our Executive Director for Student and Academic Services, Robert Partridge. So welcome to the panel and welcome to all of you joining us from your homes. Um, I think we all can recognize that these are unprecedented and uncertain times and can quite understand um, the worry that it has caused amongst our student community. Um, we really hope today that we will be able to answer many of the questions that you have and alleviate some of the concerns that you have shared with us already. And uh, we do have an awful lot that we are going to try and get through in the next hour or so. And thank you so much to those that have already submitted questions uh, to us. We have those and we will try to get through them all. But we will also be taking questions throughout the Facebook Live session as well. So at any point throughout today's session, um, please do send your questions in and we will try to get through those. But before actually I start asking some of those questions, I'd like to take the opportunity to hand over to our Principal and Vice-Chancellor, um, Professor Sir Anton Moscatelli, to say a few words of welcome. Well, thank you, Rachel, and good morning, everyone, uh, or good evening or good afternoon, as Rachel said, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us uh, for this student Q&A, and thank you in advance for the questions that you've submitted. We're going to try and address them as best that we can. Above all, I really hope that this finds you healthy and well. These are really difficult. These are really testing times that uh, the whole world is going through and that we're living in. And I'd like to thank all of our students, uh, or indeed our prospective students, for, for your patience, for your understanding, as uh, we've had to react as a university to some very fast-moving events. I think I'd like just to say two or three things to, to, to kick this off. I think our, our first priority, something I would emphasize, has been and will continue to be the safety and, and the well-being of our students, of our staff and our wider community. And that's why we acted very quickly ahead of uh, some other universities, I think, to, to end face-to-face -face teaching close to essential areas of the campus and, and move all our assessments uh, online. Uh, on exams, uh, can I reiterate uh, the main principle that we've applied? We've, we've applied a policy of no detriment, uh, which will apply during the forthcoming diet of exams and assessments. And this means that those of you sitting assessments will not be negatively affected by how you perform during this period. Um, and we're going to discuss this in more detail as the session progresses. But uh, I'd like to stress at the outset, unfortunately, there are no perfect solutions here. Uh, what we've done is to work very hard to devise an approach which recognizes the exceptional circumstances that all of you are, are dealing with. Uh, and indeed, uh, I know that as many uh, of our postgraduate students, including our PhD community, uh, have specific issues that they're concerned about and we'll come to those as well. Uh, in the middle of this disruption, the second point I'd like to make is just I want to recognize your contribution uh, as our students. Uh, I know many of you are volunteers, uh, many of you are researchers, many of you are concerned citizens, uh, many of you have joined actually actively the fight against COVID-19 because you've joined uh, ahead of time the nursing or medical or health professions. So thank you to, for all, everything that you're doing as a, as a student, as a student community. Um, as you may know, the university is hosting Scotland's central testing facility, um, which will, uh, has been announced. And, and I know our colleagues from the Centre for Virus Research are doing some really important work across the UK, both on genome sequencing and understanding the disease, but also in clinical trials against COVID-19. Uh, COVID 
but I think all these efforts are dependent on the strength of our civic response, uh, from virtual kindness campaigns to assisting the homeless, to supporting our healthcare staff and, and indeed childcare, shopping and housework, um, the volunteering that's happening there on the front line. I think that's been fantastic. And, I, and I, what the university community and what you, our students, have done has been humbling and inspiring. Um, for those of you who have applied to join us next year, this is the, this is the world changing team U of G you can be part of. I'm really sorry that our offer holders event had uh, to be uh, held virtually as opposed to on our campus. I understand that you may have questions about the way ahead uh, and some of those may not be answered today, but we are here to help our colleagues in our admissions team are here to help. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions as a follow-up about what studying in Glasgow will entail. And finally, I think what I'd like to, to do is to tell you that we are working actively on all sorts of scenarios on what the new academic year will look like. Uh, obviously, we've got to bolster our remote learning capabilities and capacity because we don't know what is going to happen around the sequence of events around the COVID-19. Uh, there are many factors here beyond our control and really nobody knows globally uh, how long the present disruption will either go on for or might be repeated until hopefully a vaccine is found and, and, and COVID-19 uh, can, be, can be managed that way. But in amongst all the uncertainty, please know this, we, we are really determined to do all that we can to safeguard your interests uh, and that we will always support our students to the very best of our abilities. Can't be perfect in the circumstances, but we'll try our very best. So thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anton. And also just to flag that we are recording this session. So the session will be shared on our web pages um, post this live event. So if anyone wants to watch it again, you might want to, um, or, or share it with your friends, then, then you are able to do that. Um, now, before I start asking some of my own questions from our student community, Scott, I might just turn to you first, because I know that um, the SRC have received a number of questions uh, directly from students, and you would like to ask those first. Yeah, thank you very much, Rachel. So I think um, we'll try and take about five minutes here to uh, initially ask a couple of questions that the SSC have been getting through. We held our own Facebook Q&A last week and really one I've got to ask is, is kind of the main themes, I suppose, that we're hearing at this current moment in time that I know a lot of students who have submitted questions today will be interested to hear about and obviously we can touch on those points a little bit later on. So just to start then, if, if that's okay, um, Obviously, the new detriment policy is, is probably the main thing that students are thinking about and worried about at the moment in time. Obviously, the policy applies um, uh, to, to all students uh, and schools are currently figuring out how, how that works in their own worlds. Um, but some students are worried that they are not covered by the new detriment policy from what we are hearing. And I, I'm going to direct this to Jill, uh, if that's okay. Um, why would this be the case and, and is this the case at all? Okay, thanks very much, um, Scott. I'd, I'd like to start by saying, um, first of all, uh, really emphasising what the principal has said about um, the well-being of our students being the number one um, priority. Um, we understand how anxious students can be about exams, even in normal circumstances. So how much worse is it for them now with um, all the uncertainties over um, the current COVID-19 um, pandemic and also about taking exams online. And on top of that, we've got some students who will have specific um, problems. For example, they may be looking after children who are at home from school. They might be taking the online exams in far distant places such as China or the USA. Um, and they may be coping with illness themselves or among their, their families. So the university is really aware of all this. And what we are trying to do with the no detriment policy is to take um, pressure off students and to allow them to prepare for exams and assessments and to take exams and assessments um, with um, as much of the anxiety about it uh, removed. So the no detriment um, policy is designed um, to prevent any disadvantage um, to students as far as possible. And it applies um, to all students. 
However, the implementation of the policy varies a little bit from programme or course, um, depending on individual student circumstances um, and programme circumstances. So that may be why some students have been concerned that the policy doesn't apply to them. But I would like to absolutely confirm that the policy applies to all students. In other words, the principle that we will do everything we possibly can to prevent any disadvantage to students will apply to all students. Um, some of the reasons why students might be worried is that, for example, they might be on a professional program or a program where um, uh, the, the um, program is accredited by a professional organisation. And that might mean that students have to complete 100% of assessment um, in order to progress. Um, so for in the, these cases, the 65% threshold for students um, to be awarded or to be offered a, a degree cannot apply. However, other aspects of the policy will apply to them. So for example, if a student um, is, um, feels that they have not performed as well as they could have in an exam or have been unable to take the exam because of illness or um, other caring responsibilities or so on, then they will be able to take the exam at the reset diet in the summer as a first sitting, so there will be no penalty applied um, to them. So there are various um, ways that we can help to make sure the no detriment policy is applied to all students, but it may not be applied in exactly the same way to every student. Does that help, um, Scott? I think, for, I think for a lot of students that will offer a bit of clarity and I know we'll probably touch on this a little bit more. If I could just follow up a little, just on the no detriment policy very briefly, we are hearing from students that they are possibly getting mixed messages through the various types of communication that they're getting, whether that's college, university or school level. I was just wondering if there's been uh, anything done to alleviate people's anxieties around that and to kind of combat that mixed message in people again. Okay, I, I think some of the mixed messaging has happened because um, schools and programmes have been very anxious to try to reassure students as quickly as possible. We do understand how anxious students are and schools have um, acted to try to reassure students. Um, in some cases, that reassurance has been provided before all of the details of the policy have been fully worked out and available. And that's why it has appeared um, that there have been mixed messages. And um, we have been in communication with schools and we are continuing um, to have a dialogue with schools and to check the communications that are going out as far as possible so that if um, there are any details that aren't quite right or in fact details that are not yet fully worked out and available um, to give to students we can help schools to um, communicate that in a way that's uh, reassuring uh, to students. I think the key thing is not to worry about um, the policy and how it's applied, but for students, as far as they're able to do in these circumstances, to prepare for their exams and to take their exams as well as possible, and to know that the university and their schools and programmes will do everything they possibly can to um, prevent any disadvantage to students some aspects of the policy will have to continue to be worked on over the next few weeks but as long as everything's worked out fully and available before the exam boards then we can assure students um, that the the policy will be um, uh, implemented for them 
Thank you, Joe. Um, so I just have, if that's okay, Rich, just one or two more uh, brief topics just to touch on here, and I'll try to keep it brief so we give ample time to answer the questions that students are sending in live. But I'm going to peel away a little bit now from the kind of undergraduate realm and ask a question of, uh, on behalf of our PGR students. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions really regarding extra provisions or, or funding maybe in place, if any at all, for postgraduate research students and really just questions generally about what the university is doing for this cohort at this trying time. Um, okay, uh, student, uh, we, Scott, we do completely um, understand why PhD students are anxious at the moment um, because they're absolutely committed to their research and um, things are, are difficult for many of them. They're unable to get into the lab and um, uh, you know, they're unable to do the field work that they wanted to do. Um, we are actively working on that at the moment. So Professor Chris Pierce, who is the um, Vice Principal for Research, is working really hard looking at all of the um, issues and problems that PhD students are, are facing at the moment and he's working with the university senior management team to come up with um, uh, solutions to the problems and, and to do what we can to help um, students. Um, I think that um, there are some specific issues that um, need to be addressed for, for students and I, I don't want to go, go into a lot of detail about that at the moment until they're fully worked um, through. But just really to reassure PhD students that we do know um, the difficulties they're facing and we will do everything we can to reassure them and relieve those difficulties and come up with solutions that will ensure that they are not disadvantaged in this um, situation either. Thank you, Joe. Oh, sorry, I could just add something to what Jill has said. <clears throat> I think it's important, absolutely, as Jill says, that we will take into account individual circumstances. So when the policy is announced around what we will do to support our PhD students, it will be very much along the lines of trying to tailor it to individual circumstances. I know one or two funders have made announcements over the last week or two, and I know that's created actually some concerns in some quarters that it's supporting those students that PhD students that we're about to complete, but not those, as Jill referred to, that actually are in the middle of their studies, and, and they're just as concerned as the ones who are currently writing up. So we, we are going to try and take an approach to this, and this is hopefully reassuring. That does try to, try to tailor it to the individual circumstances. Um, if you're doing a PhD thesis that involves largely working on a computer, for instance, you're in a different position from somebody who's undertaking field or lab work. And we, we need to tailor it to, to those circumstances. Uh, th thank you both. That's, uh, that's really useful. And I know, I mean, part of the reason why I wanted to add that question was because I know that there are a lot of PhD students in particular who are simply looking for reassurance at this time and, and acknowledgement that the university is working on these issues. And, uh, and caveating this also by saying that I, only, I just had a meeting myself with the uh, VP research, Chris Pierce, yesterday. So for the PGR students who are watching this, uh, the SRC will also continue a uh, dialogue with, uh, with Chris um, as this goes forward. But I think it was important to air that on this, on this forum. So thank you both for that. Now, finally, um, Rachel, my last question uh, is just for Jill. And it's really just in reference to graduations. Obviously, an email was put out about this a few weeks ago, but we're still getting a couple of people who just want reassurance regarding this. So. You know, a lot of students asking about what their graduation ceremonies will look like when they happen and the SLC will obviously like to see every student get the opportunity to have the ceremony that they work so hard for for students. So just for clarity, if that's okay, if that's okay Jill, what's the university's position on graduations at the moment? Thanks very much for that, um, Scott. Again, I would like to emphasise that we completely understand how disappointing it is for our students who were due to graduate this summer that they're not going to have um, that occasion um, with their family and friends at this particular time. Um, however, the university is absolutely committed um, to giving them a, a ceremony that looks as much as possible like the ceremony that they would have had this summer 
in the Butte Hall um, with gowns and um, capping by the principal and um, you know the celebration later on in the, the quads and the academic procession, the piper, the whole works. We want to do that for our students and, and we're determined to organise that. We can't at this moment definitely say when that will take place because we, um, like everybody else, we can't predict when this um, dreadful situation of the pandemic will be over. Um, and then we have to look at what's going to happen next year in terms of um, uh, you know, how the, the programme will be run and when there will be room in the um, academic calendar um, to fit in these extra um, graduation ceremonies. Um, but we are absolutely determined to do it. Can I just say that um, we didn't want to delay the actual graduation and giving students their um, parchments um, and their, their academic transcripts because we know there are some students um, who will be starting work or will be starting um, postgraduate study and need to have their degree um, to be able to do that. Um, but as I said, we're, we're absolutely determined um, to give them uh, the ceremony that they can celebrate with their family and friends and um, as a reward for um, you know, all their hard work uh, on their de degree. Thank you, Joe. Th thank you so much, Scott, for that first set of questions and, and to Jill and Anton for, for responding. Um, before I move on, I'm very conscious that we're getting lots of questions through and I, I want to kind of press ahead and answer as many of those as possible. I would just flag that for our research community specifically, there's actually lots of great content, advice and updates on our coronavirus web pages. So I think probably throughout this session, I'm going to keep plugging the fact that we have a website set up, a microsite um, with a set of FAQs cues around the coronavirus please do go and visit it you can link to it directly from our uh, university homepage, and that's been updated on a daily basis um, so lots of really great advice there for those that have very specific questions um, I want to pick up a number of questions that are around start of term dates. I think there's a, a lot of anxiety from um, the Facebook Live audience around when they might get back onto campus. For me as well, actually, I'm desperate to get back into the cloisters. You know, I'm sort of looking at it right now and I'm missing, missing the campus terribly. But before I do that, um, I know that Asil has also posted up on Facebook Live and, and we've had some questions in advance. For study abroad students, and I might come to you, Robert, uh, first, and, and Jill, you may want to chime in on this as well. We have study abroad students who are with us who are very worried about missing exams and not having the requisite credits to return to their home university with. And likewise, some of our own students who will be studying abroad and actually may be disadvantaged because of policies that host institution has put into place. Can we say a little bit about how we're addressing those concerns? Yeah, Shall I? Start off with, with that one, um, Rachel. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely aware of um, the difficulties that students, our students who've gone um, to study abroad um, and also for um, students for, from uh, other institutions who've come to Glasgow to study and also students, for example, on Erasmus programmes. Um, the collaborations group is working with the study abroad team and also the policy group to um, come up with specific arrangements for these students. As you can imagine, um, there are a large number of students from and at a large number of different institutions on a number of different programmes. So there's quite a lot of complexity um, around this issue. Um, and so to come up with um, spe specific arrangements for all of these students is taking a little bit of time and will go on taking a bit of time um, because we want to get it right. But again, we are committed to ensuring um, that these students are not um, disadvantaged by the particular circumstances we're in. Um, so I, I think, you know, reassure these students that we haven't forgotten about them. They're absolutely on our radar um, and we'll do everything we can to make sure that they have a fair outcome 
um, from uh, uh, their study abroad um, and the situation that they're in at the moment. That's great. Thank you so much, Jill. I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that, Robert. So I think it's worth adding that our partners uh, overseas have been tremendously uh, supportive, uh, I think, themselves. Um, and um, in um, almost all cases, you know, put in um, arrangements um, to ensure that the students we have overseas um, have been supported well through uh, what has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult time for all of us. Um, I, and there may well be students on um, on the Facebook live event who are wondering about what's going to happen uh, to them if they are thinking of studying abroad next year. Um, and um, just as we, uh, you know, are still thinking about our own position um, as we move into the new academic year, um, we're obviously also in, in dialogue with our partners uh, overseas to um, think through what uh, this means um, for students who might be going out or indeed coming into us um, in the next year. Um, and we'll work through that as, as, as quickly as we can in the circumstances. That's fantastic. Thank you, Robert. And actually, you've preempted the question that I was going to ask that Nai had posted on Facebook, um, actually, who has been accepted to a place to us in September as a study abroad student, but just wasn't quite sure what was happening. So um, I think the message to Nai is that we are working through that. We are working very closely with our partners. Wherever possible, we will want to accept students into the programme this, this next semester, um, but of course much of that will be dependent on the external landscape that we're all facing as well. Great, okay, maybe I can just then turn quickly to um, the, the theme of when the campus may reopen and Anton, um, I'll probably come to you first on this point if that's okay. Thanks very much Rachel, well uh, that's uh, a question but as has already been mentioned, will be partly determined by, by what is happening around our, our policies. Um, we are working through all the different scenarios. And in fact, I should say that the, it's one of the main work streams that our senior management group has been putting in place to look at various scenarios for next year, because you know, we, we know that the pandemic will hopefully be suppressed over the next few weeks, so the initial uh, impact. Uh, but we do know that the way in which these pandemics work is that there is often a second or third phase and, and all the countries around the world are, are going to be facing these issues. So, um, so we, we are taking advice, we're taking expert advice. Uh, Rachel, you, of course, leading a, a work stream, that work stream at the moment, and we're looking at various options. We're preparing ourselves, as I said uh, at the very beginning, we're preparing ourselves for the fact that we may have to take a hybrid approach to remote and learning. You know, let's take one scenario, and we don't know whether this might be the right scenario, but let's just assume one scenario that we are allowed to come back on campus, that the campus is open, but we can't, for instance, have very large classes to, for, for, for reasons of health and safety. So we may have to operate differently, and our learning environment will change, and we'll have to observe social distancing. Uh, so you know, we, we're preparing for all these possibilities. We are preparing for the possibility that we may have to start the academic year a little later. Uh, we are preparing for the fact that some of our students may want to join us later as well. So um, we can't go into details of what this will look like because a lot will depend on what happens in the next few weeks. But in the UK at the moment, we're being told that you know uh, the current uh, shutdown of campuses will certainly persist for certainly a matter of weeks still. And I think we then need to see what, what, what's possible after that. That's great. And actually, uh, Chanak has asked, um, asked on Facebook just around offer letters as well. Maybe I can just jump in on this one to say that um, we are still processing applications for the University of Glasgow. We are still making offers to qualified candidates. Um, apologies if you have felt there have been any delays to that process. Um, we have had a significant increase in applications this cycle, which is um, very pleasing, but obviously we're now trying to manage that in quite challenging circumstances. So we are actually processing applications proactively right now and if you haven't yet received an offer from us um, please don't worry uh, they are being processed and we will get that offer out to you just as soon as we possibly can. Um, I might now just turn to another theme uh, that we have received around support for our students more generally and I think that's kind of mental health support, emotional support, and perhaps some specific support as well for um, those students that have caring responsibilities or have disabilities that may impact their ability to study remotely and, and sit the exams online. So uh, Robert, I might come to you, and, and Scott, this might be something that you want to jump in on as well from the SRC perspective, but could we say a little bit about the support mechanisms that we've put into place? 
So um, I think Jill's already um, outlined um, our approach to uh, assessment in particular, which um, I, I know is on everyone's mind uh, right now. Um, and um, I think it's really important to reiterate, to un underline that no detriment posi policy position that we're taking. Um, and that, that sort of underpins, um, I think, uh, the way in which we have uh, thought about and designed um, the, the upcoming assessments. The majority of students who are sitting assessments in the next round um, will be subject to um, open 24-hour assessments, um, which um, will give um, everyone, um, regardless uh, of the situation in which they are studying um, and being assessed, just a little bit more space and time in which to work through both the technical aspects um, and the subject content uh, of, of those assessments. That's going to be particularly important for our disabled students. Um, who would be used to experiencing time adjustments um, if they were sitting close to fixed duration uh, examinations. Um, but it's also important for students who are working crowded, um, uh, crowded living environments uh, who, are, who have caring responsibilities. Um, so there are a whole series of other students on, uh, probably all of us in one way or another are affected um, by the situation we're in at the moment. And the design of the assessments uh, therefore takes us all uh, into account uh, insofar as it's possible to do. Um, and ensures that afterwards um, we end up with the best outcome for, for each of our students. Um, I think more broadly, um, just as the situation is affecting us all in terms of uh, study, work and uh, assessment, um, you know, it's, it's affecting us all in terms of our uh, sort of mental health and our, um, and, and our uh, so sort of feelings and, and, and well-being. Um, I was listening to uh, Kate and uh, William talking on the Today programme this morning about their own approach um, to, um, to, 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 the, to the situation and the importance of maintaining a structure in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, those of you who have been on, um, on meetings with me in, in the last few weeks will know that I get up every morning um, and I get, uh, I get my, uh, um, my jacket on and my, my, my tie on as if I was going to work even though I'm simply stepping across from my bedroom to the spare bedroom um, currently and that structure is really important to me um, and I think we've all got different ways um, and need to continue to develop different ways of coping in what are really quite tricky circumstances for us all. Um, the university's put together a, 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 a sort of a, um, a, a web page um, which is linked from uh, the coronavirus pages, which describes um, the ways in which uh, students and indeed staff um, can think about their well-being um, through this situation. University of Glasgow Sport has been uh, posting some really good uh, guidance on maintaining your your, your activity levels. Um, and um, we've got very clear um, signposting to the whole range of support systems that continue to operate online, um, even uh, though we're all working in slightly different situations to those uh, we're normally used to. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Robert. And I think, although it sounds a little bit trite to say, I think it's also about saying it's okay not to be okay. I think many of us might not be feeling at our best right now and we all have very different coping mechanisms for the situations that we're facing. I think what is absolutely pivotal though for both our staff role is that support is available and there's lots of fantastic assets on our web pages but there's also a lot that we're doing through our social media channels as well and Scott I don't know if you want to say anything about what the SRC in particular might be putting into place to support students directly. Well, I think the main thing from our point of view is to say, look, our advice centre are operating as normal, obviously, virtually, and our team are operating from home. And we're dealing with a number of inquiries at the moment in regards to uh, things up with the university's control, such as students who are perhaps being locked into contracts with parents for student accommodation. Um, and when it comes to, you know, those type of issues, then please visit the SRC website and get in touch with our advice centre. They're there to support you. I just wonder, Rachel, if it's okay to narrow in a little bit just on this topic of support and perhaps pose a question. But uh, just reflecting on the line of inquiry that we've had through, um, through our channels, uh, in particular for students with disabilities, I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind touching on you know, how students with disabilities are being taken into account with regards to their online assessments, you know, considering that uh, provisions would normally be put in place to help these students. I just wondered if, if, if you wouldn't mind touching on that for the moment. 
No, it's, it's a really important question. So I, I, I touched on um, the time adjustments uh, point and the majority of our disabled students would be used to uh, adjustments in the in, in the time allowed for their assessments and um, so for the main we've accommodated those uh, within um, the the 24 hour um, open assessment approach that we're taking. Remember that uh, the examinations we're setting um, are expected to take the same at time to work through as they would do um, in a closed examination situation, but we're allowing a 24 hour period in which to work through those, which accommodates for uh, the majority of, 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 of the, uh, the adjustments we'd make for disabled students. There is a, there's a small number of students who would have um, typically uh, additional support uh, provided uh, to them uh, in an examination, closed examination situation. In some ways, um, the assessment arrangement that we have in place may uh, in, in and of itself sort of mitigate that. So the fact that um, we um, are able to uh, release uh, the examinations online, um, we can use screen, screen reading software, um, the uh, answers can be entered in via a keyboard, means that some of that physical support is less necessary. But what we're doing is reaching out to each of the students who would be used to receiving those adjustments and negotiating um, appropriate arrangements for them individually, given the, the, the constraints that you, you'll be only too well aware uh, we're operating under. And I would just underline again um, the point that Jill was making at the beginning around no detriment. At the end of the day, um, for any student, disabled or otherwise, um, the only outcome of this assessment round, which is possible, is that uh, is an improvement in, in, in position uh, if you have completed 65% of your, of, your, of your assessment already. I mean, if I can does, come in as well, so Rachel, just very briefly, just uh, I think one of the softer aspects of the way in which assessment will be done, which could never be written into a policy, but it's something that Joe mentioned at the beginning, it's worth emphasizing. Uh, all of our colleagues who are marking exams will be perfectly aware of the mm really difficult circumstances in which, uh, um, in which we find ourselves. And I, I often during this period have tried to put myself back to what I was doing, you know, uh, when I was in my own discipline and what if I would have had to mark an essay or, or an exam during this time. And I know that what I would do and is what, what all of my colleagues will do is to say, goodness, you know, the students have had to do this in an extraordinarily difficult time. Those, as you've mentioned, Scott, with individual difficulties, whether they have some disability or other issue, that will be taken account of. And I think it's one of the really important points. We don't do, um, you know, norm referencing in our marking. Uh, every student will be marked on their own performance. There isn't a question where there is a you know, by, by the fact that all students have 24 hours to do their exams in some way disadvantages those who are, uh, who perhaps had some time uh, allowance before. Because we, you know, we, we, it's not a relative competition. Mm -hmm. This is, everybody's going to be uh, treated in their own merits. And as, as Robert said, if, if somebody has real difficulties because of IT access or because of the caring response, Responsibilities, then they just need to, they'll, they'll have the opportunity to speak about that individually and, and we'll, that will be taken into account. And I think that's a really important reassurance. You can't write all this down or codify it in a policy, but it's about approach <laughs> and it's about the way in which we are going to be doing this uh, as individual markers. I think, that, I think that's great, Anton, and, and hopefully it really does help to answer the question, Scott, that, that you've posed. Um, I'm very, very conscious of time running out. We will go beyond the hour because I know we've got lots of questions still mm. coming in and we really do want to respond to those. I'm going to pivot just very quickly to all of our prospective students and applicants who are watching. Hello, we very much hope to welcome you to Team U of G. I know that many of you are also concerned about not now being able to make the conditions of your offers because IELTS testing centres have closed down or you've just been directly impacted by your own um, examination timetable around uh, getting the, the credits that you will require to come and study with us. I just want to reassure that all of that is being taken into account. So in the same way that we are doing so for our current student community, we are also taking that same framework and applying it to our um, prospective student and applicant audience as well. So if you have any fears around that at all, please do reach out to our admissions team, but we already will be providing greater levels of flexibility around offer making this year. 
And in addition to um, English language proficiency tests like IELTS and TOEFL, for the first time this year and only for this year, we'll also be accepting Duolingo um, as a qualification for English language proficiency. So I just wanted to flag it because I know there's been quite a lot of questions coming through Facebook Live on that issue. Can I also now just quickly turn to accommodation, if that's okay? Um, and it would be great if we could provide a bit of an update around um, what we have done to um, accommodation contracts that are, that are university owned, but also perhaps providing some advice to those students who are in private rental accommodation, where they may find that they are coming up with some challenges around being able to pay rent, and landlords may not be as sympathetic to the external circumstances and the impact that they're having. And what is it that we can do to support those students? And I don't know whether I'll kind of turn to Scott, Robert, both of you may want to jump in on that front. I can start off um, talking on the private accommodation piece and I, I did touch on it a little bit before and I know Robert will be able to talk about the university accommodation side of things. So um, from the SRC point of view, we're obviously getting a lot of inquiries from students um, located in what we like to call PBSAs or purpose-built student accommodation and I think it's a well-known fact that in the West End there are quite a lot of them that um, are you know, built for, in particular, Glasgow University students. Now, we, our advice centre have sent letters to all of these providers asking for leniency when it comes to the contracts um, that students are on. We've had some leeway made with some of these providers, and there are some which are pushing back and we're struggling with. So I think the first call to action there for students watching this, if this sounds like a situation that you're in, please get in touch with our advice centre and we'll be able to assist in that way. And just to kind of give you an idea about what is happening nationally, there is lobbying um, going on with the NUS, which is the, the um, National Union of Students, and uh, with our colleagues in unions in Glasgow, namely it's Strathclyde, GCU and UWS, and we're trying to lobby as hard as we can with the Glasgow City Chambers and also with our local MSPs uh, to try to put forward some amendments in Scottish Parliament. All of these things are moving um, relatively quickly and are happening right now, but Unfortunately, um, with, when it comes to PBSAs, there, there is an element of um, accountability that they, they perhaps uh, don't face compared to other sectors and in industries. We're trying really hard in the SRC to uh, really fight on behalf of the students who, who perhaps may have left their rooms in, in, you know, in purposeful student accommodation and are having to still pay their rent or perhaps are not being allowed to leave at all until May, which uh, at the moment and you know, nationally with, with everyone in the student union sectors is, is something which is quite unacceptable. So we're trying really hard to lobby on that at the moment. I don't know if Robert would like to touch on what the university is doing with accommodation. Sure. I mean, it's worth just adding that um, so we have very good relationships with the private providers and, and some of them have really stepped up in, in, in an impressive way and, and, and been enormously flexible in terms of um, the, the arrangements they've put in place for students, as, as indeed we have. Um, and so we, we've kept all our references open. Um, students will know that um, we've enabled, them, enabled students to break their contracts early um, if they have choose, chosen to, uh, to, to leave the university pre-lockdown. Um, and uh, the important thing to say for, for those students who are remaining, we have quite a substantial number of students still uh, in, in university accommodation is that uh, I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to maintain good support and services to, to those students um, and uh, ensure that they uh, have not only got uh, the sort of essential um, services operating but also uh, we've, we have staff and indeed other students volunteering to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to, to shop um, and uh, obtain essential supplies for, for, for students uh, who are self-isolating for, for one reason or another. So um, important, um, it, it's been really important for us through this period to maintain good support um, for our residential student community. That's great. Thank you so much for that. And um, again, coming through Facebook Live, we have lots of our students who are uh, very keen to study abroad in the next semester. And um, obviously, this is a, a part of the university experience that they want to uh, take the opportunity to, um, to have and real concerns about the feasibility of that given the current situation. Um, Robert, it might just be worthwhile again reinforcing the communications that we're having with partners around this. I mean, I think our position very much is where it's possible to make it happen, we will do our utmost to ensure that it does. But we've got to be mindful of the restrictions that might be put into place in the external environment. 
So it, I think that's right. Um, it, it's probably a little bit too early to say um, precisely how we how we how we're going to be able to handle this um, for all the reasons that we've we've rehearsed earlier in the session. Um, but but you're absolutely right that. Um, Mobility, um, international experience um, is, um, I think, um, a really important part of um, the university experience. It's good for our students to go out. It's good for um, students from other universities to come and experience Glasgow. Um, and uh, so we're absolutely committed to continuing that. There are some, you know, alternative models um, we can explore if it becomes clear that um, achieving that for the first semester of next year is going to be um, uh, too hard, too difficult for us for, for, for uh, large numbers of students. Um, so we, we will ensure that those students who want to experience Glasgow or who want to experience something else as part of their Glasgow University um, studies um, will have the opportunity to do so. No, I think I think that's really important. And I think as well, I mean, there's lots of discussions happening across the sector around how we can support more virtual mobility as well. So although it's not the fully immersive experience that many of our students would wish for, um, I think we can be quite creative about the ways in which we are working with partners to still give our students the opportunity to connect with students at other universities in the short term, while still looking at longer and well, medium to longer term solutions around actually physical travel and um, coming back on stream. So Alex, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, we very much hope that the study abroad in the next semester will be feasible, but on the basis that it's not, we will absolutely ensure that further opportunities are made available to our student community. So I think, I think that's the kind of take home there. Um, I wanted to just kind of jump back again to many of the comments that are around feeling isolated, feeling lonely, feeling really disconnected. We will have many students watching who may actually still be in Glasgow, but actually you know, um, hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from kind of family and friends. Do we have specific advice that we can provide to those students? Or are there things that um, we need to make sure that they are aware of and that we are providing in way of support within our student community? Again, um, Scott, I don't know if I want to kind of jump to you and, and you can talk at it, about this from, from a student kind of led perspective. Yeah, it certainly can, and I can talk on behalf of all the student bodies in this space. I think um, the four student bodies, GU, QMU, GUSA, and the SRC, we're all trying hard um, to work virtually to try and you know, make sure and, and really continue that sense of community that we feel here at Glasgow. <laughs> One of the main things to say to students here who may be in that boat is you're not alone. And there'll be a lot of students who are self-isolating, who are perhaps quarantining and, you know, for example, my flatmate has left me, I'm living on my own at the moment, I'm certainly in that boat. Um, and it's really just trying to make sure, and I, I come back to Robert's point earlier, trying to make, uh, maintain a sense of, uh, of normality in, in, in the badness, you know, keeping up with your friends, your family, um, keeping tabs on each other. And, and, and as I mentioned before, there are a lot of things going on in, in a virtual space that the unions and I know many clubs and societies are doing as well to try and bring together people for various different reasons. I know the GEU yesterday had a live stream for their Hive Club night, which was utterly bizarre, but it was a great way of interacting with other students. And it's, it's really trying to stay on top of that. And, you know, yes, it's, it's very difficult. There are a lot of us who are at home at the moment and who are struggling with this and we're trying where we can to put our advice on on, on how to look after yourself and, and really the, the things to concentrate on in this time. I know the university uh, social media team are doing the same. So I don't know, Robert, if you have more to touch on in that space. I think you've done a really good job, Scott. Um, I, I was simply going to underline a point that Anton made in, in, in the opening um, remarks, and uh, I think we've touched on um, at points uh, subsequently. Uh, there's, um, you know, there are tre tremendous opportunities to, to, to volunteer and support others uh, during this uh, during this period, and uh, there are clearly the national schemes, um, and there are a variety of, of more sort of self-organised local schemes, which I think um, your colleagues in the SRC um, and uh, through the university uh, were able to signpost uh, students towards, and. I, I, I just think it's really important that we remain connected to each other and that we look out for each other in, in, in these times. Um, and in so doing, I think uh, there's, there's an enormous benefit in terms of our own sort of health and well-being. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And actually, some of the anxiety that some of our students may be feeling may also be linked to that financial hardship piece as well and some real concerns they have around that. And this might be a good time just to introduce 
um, our hardship fund rubber and some of the financial support that we've put into place. And we may also then be able to pick it up from the PGR side as well, because I know that we've had some comments in around the UKRI funding and uh, asking what the university's approach will be to this. So I'll start with you, Robert, and then maybe I'll, I'll pass to Jill or, or even Anton, who may want to come in on that. So I expect many of, many of those um, of you listening uh, will be aware that we launched uh, an emergency financial aid package uh, a week or so ago. Um, we've had a tremendous response to that. So what we've done uh, is we've created um, um, a, uh, it's a rapid response fund where you can uh, apply for up to £500 um, to um, support perhaps the purchase of some technology to enable you to access teaching, assessment or just keep in touch uh, with others during this time um, or perhaps to cover um, exceptional costs associated with uh, accommodation, sort of subsistence, travel etc. Um, and um, we've also relaxed some of the criteria around our, uh, like our larger financial hardship funds, um, so grants of uh, up to £1,500 um, which um, again we've received a, a, a tremendous response to across um, the board from uh, undergraduates through to through to postgraduate research students. Um, so um, we've um, we've received around I think a thousand um, applications to the fund so far. Continuing to receive uh, applications, um, and um, we have said exceptionally that um, given the situation for our graduating students, um, that we will maintain the fund um, for them uh, through to the through through into the autumn um, in case um, their circumstances remain difficult uh, as, they, as they move out into. Uh, in, in, into the next stage of their lives and careers. Anton, I don't know if you want to jump in on the, the UKRI funding piece. Yes, I, I mean, UKRI, I, I referred to other funders in uh, UKRI, where one of them I have recently announced uh, extensions to stipends for final year students. Uh, and I, this is why I know some people are concerned who are not in their final year. And, uh, and hence what we might be doing around our own funded students. So I can't go into the detail, obviously, of what we're talking about now, because as Jill said, we're, we're, we're with Chris Pierce leading this, we're looking at, at what we might do, but we will take a nuanced approach, as I said earlier. I think that's the right way to do it. Um, you could be affected if you're writing up, but you could be equally affected if you're a, a second year student who's in the middle of their field work. So we would rather take a more individual approach to all of this. Um, obviously, you know, we can't cover everything. Uh, I wish we could. Uh, I wish we were uh, one of those super funders that could uh, perhaps do everything for, but we will try and direct the, the support uh, in the way that we do with the hardship fund, as Robert has described, where it's needed most. And I, I, but if people can be just patient for a few uh, more days, we will try and develop something which will be hopefully a bit more targeted and nuanced than even the blanket UKRI for students who are being funded from university scholarships. That's great. Thank you so much, Anton. Um, now, I know that we do still have some questions coming in and um, please do keep sending your questions in. As I've mentioned already, we've got quite a lot to get through. So we're very aware that we're going to run a little beyond uh, the hour that's coming up. So we can we can probably squeeze in another few questions um, before we end today's session. Um, Jill, I might just come back to you if that's OK. And, and this is a question specifically around the no detriment policy. And you've already given um, a very good overview of what this means for students. But this is a particular question that's coming from Rachel who wants to know how uh, the no detriment policy will affect the final year honours students who have not attained 65% of coursework over third and fourth year. Okay thanks very much for that um, Rachel. So um, basically what happens is the um, assessment that students have completed so far within uh, junior honours and senior honours is looked at and if the student has achieved more than 65% of the amount of the assessment so far, then um, they are still encouraged to sit the exams because they can improve on um, the GPA they've achieved so far. Um, and also for, for various other reasons, for example, um, what's going to be recorded in their transcript and so on. Now, there will be some students who 
despite looking at all of the assessment they've um, already completed in junior honours and senior honours who haven't quite reached the 65% um, threshold that they need to, to be um, offered the degree. And so what will happen for those students is that um, when they sit their exams, we will look at the results of the exams that they take in this spring diet and look at the um, result that would be most advantageous to add to um, the assessments that they have already taken. Um, and we will do that until they have um, achieved the 65% threshold. Um, now, for most students, most, we find that most students um, do at least as well in their uh, final exams as they have done in assessment so far. So most of these students adding in the best result or the most advantageous result will only improve um, their GPA. For those who feel that um, they haven't um, performed as well as they could have, or um, where um, they're unhappy with the, the final um, degree classification, those students will be allowed to um, repeat um, the exams at the, the summer diet without any um, disadvantage. So they, they won't, those exam results won't be capped. Um, and what will happen is the student will be able to look at the results from the exams in the summer diet and the results from the spring diet and whichever gives them the best overall GPA or the better, there's only two to look at, the better overall GPA and um, that will be um, the um, GPA that the student will um, uh, attain and will then uh, translate into the uh, degree. That's great. Thank you, Jill. I think that's really clear and very positive outcome for students in, in quite difficult circumstances. So hopefully that does provide some reassurance. Um, I'm going to uh, come now to just a couple of further financial uh, queries. And um, after that, we may do a bit of a wrap up, uh, if, unless there's some further questions coming through on Facebook Live. And um, this has actually come to us from our Chinese student community specifically, who are concerned about increased instances of fraud at present. So this is um, a question regarding what support we're giving to international students who are dealing with telecom fraud. So that actually is where criminals are impersonating Chinese consulates or courier companies in order to get bank account details from those students. Um, Robert, is this something that you would like to pick up on? Um, so I can do. I, um, we so this this happens, um, and um, we have um, uh, episodes of this um, uh, on a, on a sort of sadly um, frequent um, basis. Um, our security team is really good um, at um, investigating these, working with uh, colleagues um, in other universities, and obviously with with uh, Police Scotland and uh, the, the police forces in other in other parts of the UK, and also with the, the consulates as, as necessary um, to um, firstly understand um, and uh, deal with the impact on individual students, but also to uh, ensure that we um, put out good information guidance um, to ensure that um, we minimise the number of people who are exposed to these things in the first place. So, um, you know. Uh, we, we know these 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 things happen from time to time. There's a, a slightly increased um, 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 sort of prevalence given the given the, given the current circumstances, um, and um, we work through them as they arise. That's great. Thank you so much, Robert. And um, Scott, did you want to come in another question? Yeah, uh, just a, a slightly tricky question, I think, um, but I think it's one that's really important to ask and I suppose acknowledge at this point in time. And this is one which reflects on, I suppose, students generally across the UK. But given that a lot of things have had to change this year to accommodate students, in particular final year students, and obviously a lot of a lot of people worried about you know trying to adapt to the situation. There are people who are also worried about how about their graduation and their employment prospects. And, you know, 
I suppose really regarding whether or not they may be stigmatized or discriminated against for being part of this year's graduating cohort. Now, I don't think that would be a problem, but is there anything we can say to reassure students that that wouldn't be an issue? I, th I think I could maybe um, st start off about that, um, Scott. Um, this is about, um, to some extent, about maintaining academic um, standards. And I would like to um, say that we are absolutely committed um, to maintaining academic standards and making sure that the University of Glasgow degree is as valued and as valuable as it ever has been. Um, and, you know, what we're talking about in terms of assessment is this particular assessment diet. But for many students, we're looking at um, a degree that they've taken over four years, or in the case of um, PG postgraduate taught students, a year, um, which will include their dissertation. Um, so I think the steps we're taking, um, it, it's really fundamental um, to my job as Clerk of Senate to maintain academic standards. And I'm pretty confident that the steps that we're taking and the policies that we're implementing will absolutely um, ensure that those standards are maintained and a University of Glasgow degree still has the same currency that it ever has. I'll, I'll pass over to, to um, the principal to, to um, say some more about this. Thanks, Jill. I mean, I would endorse everything you've said about academic standards and ultimately, Scott, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, this is not just a, a, an issue for a single university. This is actually an issue for the whole world. Uh, I mean, we know the global economy, not just the UK economy, is going to be impacted by what is happening at the moment. Um, I would say two things in reassurance of all those students who are actually either studying or are thinking about studying in Glasgow. Um, during periods of crisis, I, I think uh, one advantage in being a student in a university like Glasgow, which is acknowledged to be one of the top academic institutions, is that, you know, that is, that is something that a degree at Glasgow is worth something that matters uh, in, even in a period of, of economic downswing. But secondly, and I think this is really important, we are lobbying as a sector with government so that they understand that this isn't simply a crisis for um, you know, uh, universities or whatever. It, it, it is genuinely something which is going to impact quite considerably on, on young people. And uh, you know, those of us who graduated in the early 1980s will know what that recession brought um, in terms of potential disadvantage to those cohorts of students that graduated. So what we're doing is working very hard with government to make sure they understand that they should invest more actually in, 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 in students. Um, I know there's discussions happening at national level about what could be done around the student loan system, for example. I know that there's discussions going on about whether more could be done to help students who are perhaps completing an undergraduate degree with their postgraduate qualifications. Now, these are not things the University of Glasgow can have an impact on, but we can certainly lobby and we can certainly um, press government to invest in young people over the next two or three years as they go through uh, these difficult times. But um, I, I would say, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that this is widely acknowledged, it's not just me saying it, that a degree from a university like Glasgow is actually one that, that lasts the test of time, even during difficult times. That's great. Thank you so much, Anton. And I might just ask one final question before we round up. Um, and that's the issue of, of tuition fees and rebates. And I wonder, Anton, if you might want to say a little bit about this in terms of whether there's a, sect a sector position on uh, tuition fees and refunds and whether there's a University of Glasgow position. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to say that our approach has always been uh, as, a, as a university, but as a whole sector, that that really uh, it's about the learning that is happening uh, as part of your degree. Now, these are extraordinary circumstances and we've had to move from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning. But actually, I know how hard my colleagues have been working over the last few weeks in, in supporting students um, through that remote learning, through preparation of additional materials. So actually, in many respects, uh, universities have actually invested even more resources in learning in teaching over the last few weeks than they did even before. So um, our approach has been 
not to look at it from the angle of uh, or, um, you know, which is rather instrumental and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, I don't think fits with it. With the, with the spirit of what the university is about, which is, oh, I've, I've had few less face-to-face -face lectures, so there should be some sort of rebate. This is, this is more about saying, look, how is this impacted on you individually as a student? Um, are there hardship issues? And that's, as Robert and others have said, there are hardship funds to deal with that. But in terms of supporting learning, we, we believe that what we're providing students is actually uh, the learning on their course, which might be delivered in a different way, but it is the learning that uh, and the learning outcomes that were part of that course. So uh, it's not a. I don't think that's the right approach to to look at uh, to look at fee rebates. I, I think that's that's diminishing actually what 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 it is that we're doing as universities. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Anton, and thank you to all of the panel, and um, thank you to all of you at home joining us today. I really hope that you found the session useful and informative. And um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it has been recorded, so it will be on our web pages um, at some point in the very uh, near future. So please do check in on that, and please, please do go and visit our web pages. As I said, we have a dedicated coronavirus microsite. There are some fantastic assets and advice and information that are updated regularly on that site. Um, and we have also now created some new kind of hashtag Team U of G community pages. So we're sharing lots of advice and support and, and the option just to actually connect in with the community that, that you love and, and we love. So please do make the most of the resources that are available to you. I will also flag that there is um, a coronavirus email address so you can send any uh, email queries directly to that dedicated email address. And we also do have a help desk running. So if you'd like to kind of pick up the phone and have a chat to someone directly, we do have that help desk in place as well. Um, so beyond that, it really just falls to me to say thank you again for, for joining us. Um, I know these are really worrying times, uh, but we would like to take this opportunity to send our best wishes to you and your family. And um, also just to reinforce that you are also our family and we are here to support you every step of the way. And we are absolutely together in this. And if there is anything that you need from us, please do let us know. And um, thank you for joining us on our first ever remote Facebook Live. I hope it's worked for you as it has for us. Um, I'm sure it's the first, but it won't be the last. So hopefully we'll have many more of these sessions running in the future. But for now, um, take care and please stay safe. Thank you very much.